the Real Hustle Podcast, hosted by yours truly, Chris Kivlin. Real hustle, real people, real results. You can help support our podcast by checking out our Real Hustle gear. We have t-shirts, hoodies, tank tops, hats, and more. The Real Hustle gear is great for the gym or even a night out on the town. Let everyone know that you are a real hustler willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done. You can check us out right now at realhustle.com, and right now we're offering all of our listeners 10% off when you use the promo code PODCAST at checkout. Once again, that is PODCAST to receive 10% off your entire order. realhustle.com. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Real Hustle Podcast. My name is Chris Kiblin, and I will be your host. And today we have a very special guest in the house. We have Victoria Reinhardt here. How are you doing, Victoria? Doing great. I'm excited to be here today. I'm excited to have you. Um, So, you know... I haven't had a chance to really meet you, but you know your husband talks a lot about you <laughs> at the gym, so that's where this whole thing came up. And he's like, "You got to have her on the show. You got to put her on there. She's awesome." So I was like, "All right, let's do this." Yeah, that's awesome, isn't it? Great to have a spouse that champions for you, yes, right? That's, exactly. That's wonderful. I'm grateful to him. So let's talk about because um, he's a pharmacist and you're a pharmacist. Mm-hmm. So did you both meet in pharmacy school, or how did that work? We did meet in <laughs> pharmacy school, yeah. It's, uh, it's I guess, your classic we met in college kind of story. Right. But uh, we met in pharmacy school, and um, and we, you know, it's one of those you know you know things. Mm-hmm. We, we got married relatively quickly, and uh, we began having children, you know, earlier on before most of our, most of our mm-hmm. friends and colleagues. And uh, it just has been a whirlwind, and we've celebrated January. January will be 11 years. Wow, congratulations. So, yeah. It's and you got great. two two kids? Two two daughters. They're six and nine. And, uh, you know, they're more like 18 and, and 21 by the time you you factor in the, the SAS factor. And, and, That's and, what girls do, right? <laughs> it's, it's intense, but it's great. And they keep us on our toes. And there's a lot of, of joy in it. Okay. So let's kind of go over. So um, growing up when you were younger, did you know when you were a little kid you want to be a pharmacist? No. <laughs> no way. You know, I so was... So how did that happen? I was one of those kids. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I, when I started college, I was an accounting major, okay. super, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, I look at it now. How do you get from I, accounting to pharmacist? I know, I know. I picked accounting because I was like, uh, you know, I guess I'm kind of good at it right. and I, I, you know, I could do it. And, but it really wasn't my passion. It was more that outside pressure to pick something and like work towards it. Right. right. And, uh, and actually the story of how I became a pharmacist is really funny. I, was waiting tables, bartending and waiting tables through college. And and somebody sat in my section with his family and he said, I've been paying attention and you have a good memory and you can communicate with people and I'm watching you wait on like eight or 10 tables here. And I just, it seems like you have the skills that would be great in the profession of pharmacy. Have you ever thought about being a pharmacist? And I was like, I don't even know what a pharmacist does. I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I see them right in like a Walgreens or something. So, uh, 24 hours later, the, the pharmacy down the street had a help wanted sign. Oh, wow. And I just was like, this is crazy, but I'm going to walk in there. So I walked in and I was like, you guys are hiring. And they were like, we need somebody right now. Can you start tomorrow? Wow, that fast. <laughs> and it was like within 48 hours of, of that suggestion, I'm working my first shift in a pharmacy. And I just fell in love with it. And, and we had a really incredible impact on patients' lives and their well-being and their ability to navigate their own health. And I said, this is it, accounting. I, I'm dropping that. I'm switching. <laughs> and so I became a pharmacist and never looked back. That's a, that's a pretty cool story. I mean, it's kind of I mean, almost like it was meant to happen, right? Yeah. You have somebody talking to you about it. The next thing you know, I mean, you're working at a farm. I'm, I'm assuming you started as a tech. Yep, right? a technician, For, yep. And, and then, then and, and, and you know, again, I had it. You know, I was uh, had an inclination towards it and, and enjoyed it, and so I applied to pharmacy school and then went to pharmacy school, and yeah, that, that's so that. So explain that to me because, like, you know, I hear about pharmacy school and I hear what people talk about, and I hear it's pretty rigorous. It is, yeah. And so <laughs> it's pretty intense, mm-hmm. and so it's almost to the point that some people compare it to becoming like a doctor. Mm-hmm. So tell us a little bit about that because that's, I, I, that's what I've heard. Yes, so you do your undergraduate 
program, and then you go to pharmacy school, which is a four-year program, and so you graduate with your doctorate of pharmacy degree. So uh, so my official title is Dr. Victoria Reinhardt, mm-hmm. but uh, it's called a PharmD degree instead of an MD. Okay, like a gotcha. me- it's not right. a medical doctor degree, it's a PharmD, a doctorate of pharmacy. Um, and then after you graduate, you can either go straight into practice or you can specialize or seek out additional training for something a little bit more intense from uh, from a patient care standpoint. So then you can do you know, two years of residency or a fellowship to specialize in something like oncology or pediatrics or critical care, infectious disease, wow. all of those there's different whole, areas. I didn't so. even realize there was all that yes. in there. <laughs> yes. And so, um, and so there's a lot of different options uh, within the profession, which not a lot of people realize because a Walgreens or a CVS is, is – most people's only recognition. That's the only thing I know of. <laughs> yes. And, you know, you know my husband, and yes. my husband works in a hospital setting. He told me a little bit about what he does, and he does something a little bit different, too. Yes, he does. Yes. So, you know, if you go to the hospital, you, you go into the ER, and and you're sick, right? They draw some blood. They check your labs. There is a pharmacist on the tail end of that or behind the scenes that is looking at your lab work and mm-hmm. looking at your disease presentation and figuring out exactly what dose, which antibiotic, all of those components that you need to get you better. And right. so then they actually go and not only dose that out, select the right drugs, but then prepare that drug and send it to you to the nurses at the floor. So there are a lot of pharmacy uh, experts behind the scenes that are that are doing a lot of the critical work there. Because it was kind of cool. Because one of the things he was telling me is like, you know, he'll get like they'll be like, okay, look at this, and like a doctor might suggest something, be like, no, that doesn't work. Right. You'd be like surprised. You'd be like, no, 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 no. You've got to do this, or you got to switch this, or whatever. And did you think about this part? Because there's a lot of the critical thinking, I guess, behind it. As mm-hmm. he was telling me, and he's like. Because what happens if we give them this or, you know, that could affect this if we don't, you know, and it was pretty interesting. I, and I never thought about it because, you know, when you most people, when they think about a pharmacist, right, your doctor prescribes you a prescription, you go to the pharmacist, the pharmacist fills it and you're done. Mm-hmm. Right. They don't. I never thought like when Lucas was telling me that and it was like, hey, you know, this is what you know, what I have to really dig deep. Yes. Into, especially if they're in the surgery because it'd be like they're doing a surgery or whatever. So I was like, that's 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 really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, very few people recognize how many drug interactions there are. Um, really, how many patients are harmed every year by medicines, and so. Uh, Physicians are doing the absolute best that they can all the time, but they have so much from an assessment diagnostic standpoint to have to call on and remember, you know, their one semester of pharmacology or two semesters of pharmacology, if they're lucky, wow. is is really not enough versus a pharmacist has six or eight different semesters of that. And so... It really is wonderful, and, and most of the larger hospital systems have now recognized that having that interprofessional, uh, co- you know, complementary expertise of we have the physician, the physician identifies the problem, perhaps has a path that they want to go to treat that patient, but then they bring in that pharmacist to say, is this the right actual drug choice? Is this the right dose? What's the monitoring that we need, right? And they work together to make sure that the patient care is optimized and and really you have better outcomes with that so that's pretty interesting i mean it's i was i was really i mean because that's i mean most people always think like what i just said and i was like didn't they even know all that? Yes. So let's talk a little bit about you and not so much about him because he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> so you became a pharmacist. Where did you start? And then I know that you've grown into your own business. Mm-hmm. But let's start. Where, where did you first start with your farm? Did you start at a Walgreens? Or <laughs> like, I did. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I did. I started with a Target. So okay. Target had a pharmacy. Now that that's now been purchased by CVS uh, six or seven years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when Target Pharmacy was Target Pharmacy, I was a a pharmacy manager for them. And I loved it. I loved the interaction with with patients and the impact I was making. And, uh, you know, I I started to recognize that I really enjoyed training new pharmacists. I eventually was recruited by the local school of pharmacy, which is LECOM School of Pharmacy. And I still do hold a faculty appointment there. I love to teach. It was a really wonderful role for me. And, And so I did that for 
uh, for about six years now or so. And uh, a few years ago, I started doing some consulting. Okay. And so really that would look like, uh, you know, a team would bring me in to say, what are the medication problems? Or if we're trying to, you know, create a new uh, software that processes, you know, processes medication orders, or if we're trying to, you know, implement a new clinical service, what are the, the medication needs that our patient population is going to have? And so uh, I was brought in by the Department of Health to do some consulting for a concept called community paramedicine. And that is kind of where we're launching into what I do now. Okay, so yeah, tell us about that. So the concept of community paramedicine is taking paramedics who respond to 911 calls, right? Mm -hmm. They know the patients in their community that are sickest. They know the patients who don't have the food and the, the finances and the medications and the doctors that they need and who keep falling back into that 911 system. So okay. we, we know this, right? right? In all of our communities, we have patients who either don't have a primary care doctor or aren't insured or don't speak English or for whatever reason don't have the resources. They don't have access to the care they need. Right. And so they end up going to the ER as their, that's the only way they can. As their primary care. Because they, they can't turn them away. Correct. Yes. And so we know, obviously, that overall their health continues to decline because mm -hmm. they need primary care. We know that this is a very expensive way for health care mm -hmm. in our community to be. And uh, so what I do now is I work with community paramedic and mobile integrated health teams. And so that means we take those paramedics who know which patients are calling 911, who know which patients are really in highest need. And we give them additional resources like training in substance use disorders, training in mental health, training in some chronic disease management. And we partner them with people like a physician, a family physician, a social worker, a pharmacist. And then we send that interprofessional team out into the community proactively to yeah. say, you know, Mrs. Smith, you've called 911 three times this month. Before you end up in the hospital again, let's figure out what social, what disease, what medication problems you're having. Let's fix those so that you can stay home. You can stay healthy. You can stay out of the hospital. And it's a win for everybody because that patient has better outcomes. And now our overall health care costs are much less for our community as well. That's pretty ingenious, actually. <laughs> it's it's really been a wonderful way to deliver care, and and it works. It's highly effective. How do you get funding for it, though? Oh, this is <laughs> this is the most favorite thing to talk about. So, the funding piece can be challenging. So. Um, it really is going to be dependent on the need in that community and who's financially suffering in that community, right? right? right. So, f you know, for example, if a hospital is having, you know, um, uh, payment dings or, or whatever, payment penalties, because mm -hmm. too many of their patients are getting hospitalized, the hospital or the health system might fund a program like that. Uh, if we have an actual payer, like like Medicare, like Blue Cross, that recognizes, hmm, th this zip code over here, they're, they're expensive, right? right. Th this patient population in this state is very expensive for us to, to provide care for. They might say, maybe we should, maybe we should pay for one of these teams to go out and target that area and provide additional care and connect those patients to the resources they need so that as the insurer, it costs us less money. And this is what your business does, right? Your, so, it's your business that started all this? So so my business in particular supports these teams. Okay, so good. these teams are established all over the country. Okay. They're, they're growing by every day we have a new team that gets established somewhere. Uh, we now have several hundred teams throughout the United States. They're not my teams, but what I do in my business is I go in and provide support to them. And that can look like really three main things. The first thing that I do is uh, clinical education and training. So I use my, my several years as a faculty member in higher education and uh, my disease expertise, and we create customized training so that a paramedic who usually handles emergencies, right. when they come into a home and that patient's got 
really severe COPD Mm -hmm. or really severe heart failure, that they understand the chronic disease management piece. And so that clinical education and training is what we do. The second component that we do for my business is like protocol development and workflow troubleshooting. So you can't just take any clinician and and be like, good luck, go see the patient. (laughs) You need processes in place to say, you know, what do we do if if there is a safety concern in the home? Or or, uh, what is the protocol if I find my patient doesn't have, um, you know, doesn't have access to food? Oh, like geez, where, yeah. where do I turn and what do I do and who do I speak to and what are the resources that I have? And so we put protocols and workflows in place so that these teams know what to do when they're in the field. Because I'm sure that's got to be difficult for them. Absolutely. I mean, on them, I'm sure to see these people with no food or this not the resources or I'm sure and also not even probably the livability of the person's home. Oh, absolutely. And it really there is a lot of a lot of devastation and sadness, really. When you, when you get in there, you know, the poverty can be, um, I mean, it, in a way it, it really is heartbreaking. Right. But I think that it shows you how just how severely this patient needs you. Right. Right. And that when you can help even in the smallest way, lift them up out of some of that, that it, it really, it really ends up while heartbreaking, also can can be really fulfilling. Because that's what I was going to say. I mean, you know, I think sometimes like that, I think you have to look at it from that approach, right? I think that's with anything, like as far as whether you're a cop or you're, an, you know, you're, you're an EMT, doctor, whatever. I think that's got to be why you do what you do. Mm-hmm. Not so much for the money, but mm-hmm. why you are out there helping people. Because... That part, that other part, would be super tough. I mean, my dad was a cop for 22 years, and some of the stories that he told me and stuff that he's seen, and, you know, and it was just, it's crazy. And so, like, you know, you go through a lot, but you got to remember why you're there, you know, and what you, why you're there to help people and help them get them, even if it's just a little bit to bring them up somewhat. Because you can't, I I think, you can't do it for the money. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, it's, 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 it, it, the money is one thing, but like, I mean, you just, I mean, I think you just, if you look at it from the standpoint, it's like, how can I help this person? And that's the gratifying thing that I'm doing. Yeah. And I think I, I personally have experienced what, what you're describing more with the, the third component of what I'm, what I offer. And that is really direct patient care services. And so how that gets implemented is, you know, there's all sorts of scenarios where a, pa- a patient um, calls calls the paramedic team. They go to the home. The patients, you know, uh, maybe their blood sugar is too low, right? They're they're they took too much insulin, or their insulin dose is off from their diabetes, and now their their blood sugar has tanked, and they feel miserable and we can fix that outpatient, right? Yeah. We can fix that in the home. We know what to do to bring the blood sugar up. We know how to do that safely. So we do that. But then the paramedic says, well, do they take their insulin again tonight? Or should we change the dose of the insulin until they can see their doctor tomorrow? And so that's where we come in, right? And so as part of that direct patient care, we get on telehealth or we get on the phone with that patient and that paramedic team who are in the home, and we say, this is how to safely use the medicines right now, right, right in this scenario. Because, again, that patient is in a, a period of acute need, and without that support, they're looking at another episode tomorrow with their blood sugar, or they're looking at another hospitalization this week right now if we can't get that under control. And so uh, for these teams to have a resource of a pharmacist to be able to get on the phone and say, what do I do with the 20 medicine bottles that I have in front of me right here in this patient's oh home? There is there's an incredible amount of benefit not only to the team that's in the home to have that resource, but also for that for that patient. And when you call them the next day is a checkup, right? And they're doing great and their blood sugar is stable and they're home and they're not in the hospital, then you've made a huge impact on that individual. 
Yeah, because I'm sure that again, I, I'm sure that's taxing on the on the patient, right? I mean, oh, going yes. to the hospital all the time, having to deal with all that. So I mean, that, I'm sure that's a huge help in their part, and I'm, and I'm sure I'm sure the insurance companies are starting to probably see the benefit and the cost of it mm-hmm. by doing what you guys are doing. Yes, absolutely. So that, that's pretty interesting on how you guys have put all that together. Yeah, it's it's been fun to be honest. Yeah. You know, it's a lot of outside the box thinking. I remember when I first stepped into this field. People were like, I'm sorry, you want to do what? <laughs> like, you don't, you, that's not where pharmacists work. And that's not, that's not what a paramedic's job is. And, and I think sometimes you have to, you have to say, yeah, this is a crazy idea, but I'm going to go for it because I think it's going to work. And, uh, you know, if you're smart enough on the front end to be able to track and, and document and, and really evaluate the impact you're making, um, then then you're setting yourself up for success to figure out yeah this is a this is a model of care that is financially feasible is sustainable and makes a difference in the the health of our communities yeah that's that's pretty awesome so now with you and your husband because you both are pharmacists uh we were talking about this before there i was wondering because if there's competitiveness there you're you're growing this massive business (laughs) he's working at the hospital you know or and then do you guys share stories i mean you know because that you know i mean you guys both do this well sort of the same thing yeah but you know it's like so how's that all work oh yeah so honestly you know not everybody wants to be married to a spouse that does the same line of work Mm -hmm. uh i think in our situation it just it's it just works really well for us to be in the same industry in the same field on a personal note you know the person you come home to you can say one thing and they go oh man all right let me let me make you let me make you a, a, an ice cream or let, <laughs> right. you know let me take care of you or, or whatever because they know exactly what you dealt with or how significant that is in your in your field and so I think on a personal note, it's helped us have a lot of empathy and, and meet each other from a marriage standpoint where we where we need to. Uh, from a competitiveness standpoint, you know, we have such complementary fields, right? He's more critical care. He's more um, in hospital. He's more, uh, you know, em, uh, emergency medicine. I'm actually more chronic disease, figuring out how to change a care model, uh, patient counseling sort of expertise. And so it's so complimentary that we do a lot of like phone to phone consults sometimes where I'll see a drug and I know it's a drug that's used in the hospital, but not really in the pa- in the patient's home. But if I'm stuck, I'll be like, OK, I need to call you. Tell me <laughs> what's my top five things, right, that I need to know. And and so it's actually been helpful that that we're both in this field. That's pretty awesome because you run ideas off each other mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. So where do you see your business growing to? Where do you think it's going to get? I mean, what's the next level? I don't know. And you know, I think that I'm in a I'm in a really pivotal pivotal point right now in in figuring out really how to scale. So uh, there are not too many pharmacists that are in this like very specialized area of practice. You know, it's a growing field. There, uh, while people are paying attention to this and these teams are growing, again, there's not very many of me, right? Right. And so that's great. I've had yeah. success on that front, but you know, I'm recognizing I can't I can't go to four conferences this month <laughs> and speak about what I do or whatever. And so I am in the process of that uncomfortable emotional and psychological like step of recognizing that I need to train to re- replace myself <laughs> in a sense right <laughs> I need to train someone and in in scale to grow a team so that others can do what I do and have that expertise and um, and so that's what I see right. right I see that you know right now there's a couple hundred uh, teams across the country but it's growing every day and so there's going to be too many Thanks. and i'm not going to be able to be personally available for all of them so uh, that's where i'm at right now is i i recognize that 
there is a need to scale this expertise and these offerings, figure out how to automate whatever I can to, to have available without me being personally present and training others so that they can do a lot of what I do and, and have the same expertise that I have um, so that we can, we can help in all 50 states. My company's mission is to empower these teams in all 50 states. That's so awesome. that is a goal that I have is to work with teams uh, in, in every state within the U.S., that's, so it's a pretty lofty goal. It is, <laughs> but you know what? Uh, uh, people said that this entire concept was crazy. So to me, fifty states doesn't seem crazy. Uh, it's all perspective. It's all perspective, right? I love that you said that. Perspective <laughs> is is so valuable. So mm, yeah, exactly. All right. So one of the things I was actually reading a little bit about you is you. Um, I guess you are one of the top fifty. Most influential pharmacist? Is that what that was? That is, is that what I read? Crazy, right? right? It is so, crazy. Tell me a little bit about that. Yes. So I I was the recipient this year. I was named one of the top fifty most influential leaders in pharmacy. And I just I don't sometimes I still am like, what? Like that? <laughs> uh, I it's a it's hugely humbling. Uh, you know, there's I want to say there's over 315,000 pharmacists now, wow. which, and so when you look at that number, that just blows your mind. And, you know, I, I think that, I think sometimes I'm like, how can that even be true? There's so many people doing amazing work that um, it's just remarkable to me. And in the company, the other people that were, you know, the other top 49 are just amazing, and they're you know national presidents of pharmacy organizations and and uh, thought leaders and people that are making incredible legislative change for uh, improving patient care and patient access to pharmacist services and and it's an honor to be among them for sure. But I think that you know um, possibly the reason I ended up on that list is because. I really do think that the access to care problem that we have in our country is unacceptable. And I think that we can fix it. I was going to ask you about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was, yeah. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's that's a huge mission that I have. I, I think that, you know, we're one of the most developed countries in the world. And yet we have uh, we have homeless veterans living under bridges who can't get their mental health care. And we have, uh, you know, diabetic disabled patients that are living in squalor in their homes because they can't find a ride to their doctor. Mm -hmm. Right. Or because they live in a rural area where there's a, a primary care physician shortage area. And and it's not acceptable to me and it's devastating and i i know that we have models of care like mobilizing teams to their communities that will fix that problem and it's doable so i think that's one of the things that i think you're changing the way of that right i mean you know because that's one of the biggest things because i'm a veteran and so you know and it breaks my heart to see when i see somebody who went out and they fought for our country and like you said living under a bridge because they can't get what they need i mean there's 22 veterans that kill themselves every day and so you know for suicide because of what they've you know whatever they've gone through mm -hmm. and so and they're not getting the care you know and yet we are one of the most abundant countries in the world and we can't figure this out and there's got to be ways to figure this out i mean you know and, and the prescription drugs that are out there you know i think we need to do better i think we need to make it more affordable for people mm -hmm. who can't get it um you know and you know and i'm not trying to be controversial here but like it's just like some of the things that you see is like all right we got to take care of our people you mm -hmm. know and people that need it and give them a better life and so, like, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you about also is how did COVID affect you with all this? Um, yeah, you know, and first of all, I, I do want to say thank you for your service. Uh, you. Veterans are close to my heart. My baby brother is a is currently serving. He's uh, he's Army Airborne. And awesome. um, yeah, so. So I do appreciate you highlighting the statistic of, of the need that we have in that population. And thanks for your service as well. Um, you know, COVID has been, it's been devastating to the entire healthcare community. I think that uh, in a sense, it highlighted just how much we need 
this mm-hmm. uh, this concept of sending teams out to patients' homes because it's crazy right now. M- maybe we want patients to stay in their home and not come to the hospital, right? Well, not only that, I was reading a thing that said that like people were saying that we're having more cancer patients now than ever before because they're scared to come out of their home because of COVID too. Yeah, so they never went and got their the, annual the colonoscopy yeah. or their, you know, their mammogram and yeah, you're exactly right. Their annual blood work to mm-hmm. identify if, if certain things with their organs are going, you know, awry. Absolutely. And and we're going to be seeing the, the long-term effects of COVID for a long time. You look at things like mental health, mm-hmm. right? The, They're stuck in their house, not being able to get out. Yep. The mental health, the loneliness aspect. Mm-hmm. There's so many different areas of health care uh, that have been impacted. And it, it's highlighted the need for this this model of care for sure. As far as, you know, from my standpoint, I think actually uh, there are some silver linings, right, in the sense that that my business has grown through COVID. Uh, We were able to pivot pretty successfully, and we have done a lot of virtual trainings and webinars and and things, speaking events and, and, and whatnot. So we've been able to be okay from a, a business standpoint and, and have continued to grow, which is good. Talk about perspective, right? <laughs> right. There's, so there's things to be grateful there for, but, um, but yeah, certainly it, it, it's basically demonstrating that this model of care is needed. Absolutely. So my, one, my, one of my last questions I want to ask you and get your perspective on. All right. So, and like I'm not trying to be controversial about this, but what we're seeing, and since you and your husband are both in the medical field, is the vaccine. Yes. And I mean, I have in the mortgage world because that's what I do for a living. That's what pays the bills. Uh-huh. I have. I deal with a lot of doctors, nurses, and now all of a sudden they're making them get these vaccines. I have a lot of people who are calling me, going, "Hey, Chris, I'm probably going to quit my job." because I don't want to get the vaccine, you know, um, because I know one of the hospitals around here that, yeah, you can do the medical redemption and you can, or what is it, religion, right? Yep, Your religion an, yep, or an exemption. exemption. Mm-hmm. So you can do that. But then, of course, they make you wear a special badge. And she was telling me that they make you eat, you know, by yourself and all this stuff. How does that affect everything? Because if you're having doctors walk out, mm-hmm. we're already short-staffed on medical, you know, people. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you know, what's your thoughts on that? Because, like, that's one of the things I I mean, I get it. I get that we want to protect everyone. But we're also didn't have everybody vaccinated before and when all of our hospital people were there. So, like, I'm trying to be logical about this, but Mm -hmm. I'm also trying to be like, okay, well, this also doesn't make sense. Yeah. I, I can see, you know, we have to keep in mind this is a litigious society, Right. Imagine you're a health system and you have a patient come to your hospital and contracts COVID and dies from one of your providers who you let work without a mask Mm -hmm. and without being vaccinated. Right. And so uh, I'm a I'm a strong proponent that that people should be empowered to make individual decisions for themselves. Um, But I understand from the legal standpoint. Right. That's why why I wanted your perspective on it. Because like I wanted to be open minded about this because like what you just said, I would have never thought about. Mm -hmm. Okay, because let's just say that you do have that person who comes in and does catch COVID from a doctor or whoever who wasn't vaccinated. And then are they now suing the hospital? Correct. And you bet they would. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, there's a reason why um, there's a multifactorial reason why healthcare providers were listed in the 1A for Mm. being get vaccinated when the vaccine was first available. Because, number one, they have the highest risk of contraction taking care of COVID positive patients. Uh, But also how devastating would it be to give someone COVID, right, who was hospitalized for a different acute reason. And so I just am saying that, um, you know, without commenting on whether people should be able to work vaccinated or unvaccinated, that I understand the legal perspective of why that would be put in place. Um, I think that, you know, I also will bring the perspective of mobilized care to light here. So, 
for physicians or nurses or, you know, social workers or any professional that is saying, you know, I'm not, I don't think that I want to get vaccinated for whatever personal reason they choose. What I do in the teams that I work with are literally providing care, not in a traditional healthcare setting. And so Imagine if you had a paramedic that was in a home working with a patient, they can pull up a nurse on telehealth or a provider on telehealth and provide care to that patient, right, without the provider being in front of that patient, physically present in front of that patient, right? So for those clinicians that are feeling like you know my uh, my my career might be over cuz i'm not I, that you know the the line is drawn in the sand and i am not <laughs> doing it there's pretty hard stances out there let me tell there you there are i i i would totally agree with you and so. and i have colleagues that you know were really on the fence for a while and mm-hmm. either have stuck to that to that personal feeling right or have decided to get vaccinated, right? But I guess my point is, is that um, if I'm doing anything, I think I'm showing that there's not one way to deliver care. Right. And if you still want to be a physician that's making a huge impact, if you still want to be a nurse or a nurse practitioner that's making a huge impact, um, we're showing that let's change the model of care. We can get you on telehealth. We can you can work with teams in a slightly different uh, capacity or different approach, and still be hugely impactful. Still love your job. Still get a lot of satisfaction, and and you know, mm-hmm. I mean, it's not the end of the road, right? Right. I guess is what mm-hmm. I'm saying. Right. There's there's other op- opportunities for them that's out there. Correct. Because you know that's the thing is like you know, and you do have people, and they love what they do, right? Mm-hmm. But for whatever reason, you just, I mean, who knows what their reason is? And everybody has the right to have their own reason. It's just like, you know, they just don't know if that's what they want right now, Mm -hmm. Um, you know. And I think, you know, and that's, you know, and I kind of understand it. But as, and I kind of understand the hospital's point, you know. So, like, it's it's a tough decision. It's a tough decision for anybody is in that. Because I can see where the hospital would be like, look, we got to make sure that we're not part of this, right. you know? Um, so it's either you do it or you don't. And, you know, and I guess I understand that from that standpoint. Mm-hmm. And I never thought about it that way. And yeah. that's why, like, that's why I asked you about it. And I was like, because, you know, I hear the stories and I hear what's going on, you know, especially because, like I said, I have a lot of clients that are like that. I got a lot of friends like that. And, you know, and it was just, it's inter- interesting to me. Yeah, it absolutely is. And and I think that no matter what your personal beliefs are, right, that uh, that we just have to focus on, okay, so, so what are the opportunities that can be created out of this unfortunate situation, right? If a provider or an individual clinician in their health system find themselves at an impasse, then, um, then that provider, it's a, it's a great opportunity for them to reinvent. And I know that across the board, there are a lot of different healthcare entities that have not put in mandatory vaccination policies who are actively recruiting and finding that in the great resignation that mm-hmm. we're finding ourselves in as a nation, that, uh, that they're not having maybe as quite a, a difficult time because of that. Gotcha. Okay. Anything you want to add? Anything else you want to talk about? No, I don't think so. I would say, you know, uh, I I feel like this has been a pretty incredible journey, you know, not only as an entrepreneur and, and the things that I learn every day, but uh, but also as a clinician. I think that um, your your audience, if there's any anybody that that wants to, you know, partner or figure out how to connect with me, um, LinkedIn is a great is a great option. Um, my website is mobilehealthconsultants.com. And uh, I'm happy to, to collaborate with anybody in the community or, or if uh, you have groups that are looking for health education, uh, I'm happy to figure out if, if we can support them in some way. That's awesome. It's awesome to see what you're doing and how you're giving back. I mean, because I'm sure that's your bigger cause. And so like, you know, and it's, it's a cool concept. I'm Thank glad you. we had you on here. Thanks Thank for coming. Thank you. All right. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. And make sure you check us out at um, realhustle.com. And we'll talk to you next week.